We're going to make a highly accurate table saw sled with an adjustable base and a stop block for repeatable lengths. And spoiler alert, we'll get this sled to 1 1,000th of an inch in accuracy. The adjustable base means we can use it with any blade in the shop from a thin curved blade to a dado blade an inch or so wide. The base slides and tracks in a very linear fashion and just feels good to use in general. Here we are cutting a 1 inch dado. The base of the sled and its adjustable proximity to the blade acts as a zero clearance insert so we get a clean cut with very minimal splintering every single time. The great thing about an adjustable base on a table saw sled is that you really only require one sled in the shop to do 90 degree cuts with any blade anytime. Nice clean cut. Enough talking about the sled, let's get this build underway. We're starting out with a simple piece of 3 quarter inch plywood. It's about 48 inches long and 24 inches wide to start. We'll definitely reduce the size a little bit. You may wonder why I put bright white formica, or often called laminate, on this table saw sled. It's mainly for looks to be honest. You can see in this shot that this type of plywood has a tendency to turn fairly brown over time as it gets exposed to sunlight and ages. The sapwood in the plywood gets quite dark within the very first year. There are a couple of small benefits to laminate. For example, it makes a table saw sled slide very nicely on the table saw. I can also spot any sawdust on the sled very easily and give it a quick brush before I have any misalignment cutting the next piece. But if you're not a laminate person, you don't have to use it. It's completely optional. Before we start cutting anything, we need to do a couple of checks on the table saw. First, we need to determine if our saw arbor stacks blades to the left or to the right. This, in turn, will determine which side of the sled needs to be the adjusting side. When standing in front of my saw, you can see that the arbor stacks blades to the left. So, I need the sliding base on the left side of the sled. If your saw stacks blades to the right, make sure to put the sliding base on the right side of the sled. Next, take a minute and check your blade for squareness to the tabletop. My blade is square, so I'm good to go. If your blade needs an adjustment, adjust the bevel until it aligns perfectly. You want zero light between the square and the blade. If your shop is a bit dark, put a flashlight behind the square so you can spot any light leaks. Let's start cutting now. I'm going to trim this panel down to 23 inches wide and I'll keep it at 24 inches tall. I like this size for my table saw. It's wide enough to provide a good reference on the fence, but not so wide that it's too big and bulky. I also have enough height here to use the majority of my bar and always have the sled well referenced in my track. Let's grab a sheet of Formica and get it on my assembly table. Then let's get our plywood and figure out where we need to cut the Formica. We want the Formica or laminate to overhang the plywood and we can trim the overhang later. There's lots of ways to cut laminate sheets. You can use a handheld laminate cutter and score the sheet along a straight edge and then snap it at the score line. Or you can use a saw like I am here. I'm cutting out a sheet for both sides of the sled base. I'll spare you some repetitive video. Here's a shot of the cut line using the track saw. It's a pretty clean cut with a sharp blade, but it dulls blades faster than wood in my experience. So take that into account. I'll show you the blade that I use if you're interested. This blade is made for wood, but it can do the job on laminate as well. Let's get ready to glue. I'm going to cover my assembly table with some paper that's waxed on one side because I don't want glue stuck to my tabletop. I'm going to use 3M Super 77 adhesive. I've used this many times over the years and always had good results. Let's give it a shake and apply the adhesive. You can see why I protected the tabletop. There's always some overspray. I don't really know if you need to wear a mask with this spray. I noted on the 3M site that people doing demos did not have masks on. I might be a little more paranoid here than I need to be. By the way, the fumes or odor with this adhesive is very minimal. It doesn't smell too bad at all. I have a couple doors open for a little extra ventilation to be safe. Make sure that you have good coverage everywhere and then let it dry for a couple of minutes until it gets tacky to the touch. After a couple of minutes, I do the knuckle test. If it sticks to my knuckle and has some tack, then I'm ready to go for it. Put your laminate panel on top and make sure you have some overhang on all sides. I press it down by hand and then use a J roller to make sure I have good contact everywhere. Don't forget to carefully roll out to the edges so the panel is adhered well everywhere. I'll flip this over now and move it to a clean area of paper and start the other side. The process for the second side is exactly the same, so I'll speed this up quite a bit. I'll put down a spare bit of pegboard that I had around the shop to help distribute the weight of the water bottles a little bit. 
I like to use water bottles as weights. It keeps them out of the landfill and they're very inexpensive as well. Each bottle weighs a little less than 9 pounds or about 4 kilos. So if I stack 9 bottles on here, I have about 80 pounds of weight in round numbers. That's more than enough to press down some laminate. I'll leave this to dry. Okay, it's dry, just like that, so let's keep moving. Off go the bottles and the pegboard. The surface looks flat. I like to check the edges to see if there's any gap between the plywood and the laminate. And in this case, we look great all the way around. So this lamination gets the big thumbs up. Let's move over to the router table and do a trim. I've removed my fence so that you can see more clearly. I'm using a carbide flush trim bit in the router and I'm trimming the laminate to the edge of the plywood. The bottom edge is a bit tricky because I'm operating a bit blind to give you a better view. I'm going by feel and router noise. I think you get the idea here so I'll skip ahead. If you do have any spots that are not perfectly smooth, you can always touch them up with a second pass. Let's move over to the table saw and we'll cut off the piece that will be the movable part of the base. In my case, this piece is about 6 inches wide. Once cut, put a pencil mark on both ends of the pieces so you know where the two pieces mate together perfectly. This will be handy during assembly. For the runner that fits into the miter gauge slot on the table saw, I'm using an aluminum runner from Craig. Aluminum in this case is better than a wood runner. Wood shrinks and expands and will wear more in the slot and will become less accurate over time. As you can see, this runner fits the miter gauge slot perfectly without any side to side wiggle and yet slides back and forth like a puck on ice. Let's get a close up of the bar and see what's up. The bottom of the bar has some recessed holes that we'll use to attach it to the table saw sled base. The sides have some adjustable screws, sometimes called grub screws, that you can use to set the width perfectly to your table saw miter gauge slot. In general, I leave the grub screws screwed in on one side of the bar and then I adjust the other screws to match the slot. That gives me one reference side and one adjusted side. This bar is a bit longer than I need but I can trim aluminum down at the miter saw with a carbide blade. I keep some older well-used blades around for this very purpose. The cut quality on the end is not bad. It can be cleaned up a bit with a file. We'll give the cut edge a little bevel and just knock any high spots off the cut edge. Now I should note that I've not moved the table saw fence since I did the cut on the base so my spot is held on the saw. I'm going to throw a little money at this project to help raise the bar off the bottom of the table of the miter slot. Using a square, I can see and feel that the bar is just slightly above the tabletop by a very thin margin. For our next step, we're going to glue the bar to the bottom of the table saw sled base. We're using CA glue. Specifically, I'm using Easy Bond Thick CA glue. I'm also using an accelerator from Starbond to make the glue dry faster. In order to ensure that I don't get glue all over my table saw surface, I'm using more paper and some painter's tape. This also makes the tabletop surface more on par with a very slightly raised bar. We want to use just enough CA glue to stick the bar to the underside of the sled and hold it there until we put some screws in. So I'm just using some drops and hoping it does not spread too wide and that I can place the sled cleanly on top. I mark the bar location on the bottom of the table saw sled simply by putting it over the bar and against the fence and then marking both ends. These marks tell me approximately where to apply the accelerator. Now get the base in place and set it down and apply some pressure. Truthfully, I held it for about 6 minutes but I probably didn't need to do it that long. While I was holding it, I said a little prayer. Dear Norm Abrams, please don't let me glue this bar into the miter slot or the sled base to my table saw. You know, I have applied too much CA glue in the past and even glued myself to stuff. Make me a better woodworker this time. Amen. Hey, it's better to be safe than sorry. Okay, let's lift it up and see what happens. Give it a little wiggle action and bingo, we're free. Let's get it over to the assembly table and put some screws in it. In order to get the screw holes well centered, I'm going to use a spring-loaded self-centering drill bit. I'm going to take one extra step here and just remove the laminate from the top of the hole so I don't have any risk of it chipping out as I drive in the screws. This is experience talking, so take this advice. 
When laminate chips, it breaks like a potato chip. You don't know how big the chip will be and what shape it's going to take. Let's snug some screws in here. Now we have the runner fully attached and we know the base is aligned perfectly to the blade and the table saw because we used the saw fence location that we used when we cut the base. Everything is looking good. Okay, let's think about getting our sled fences underway. I'm going to use some beach for the fences. I also purchased some Craig track that I can use with a Craig swing stop. I think this beach is plenty dry, but let's do a quick check. It says 6%, which is plenty dry for a Canadian winter, so it's a decent fence candidate. I checked the other beach boards and they were all within a small margin of 6%. We'll do a rough cut on the fences here. I need two fences on the sled and I'm going to cut a third as well to make the slider assemblies and have some left to help with the final assembly. I'll just cut a couple here and save you some time. I'll let the pieces settle overnight and then I'll fine tune them to final square dimensions in the morning. Okay, so it's the next day now. I've jointed a good square edge onto the pieces. I'll put the good edge against the fence. I'm going to cut the width to two and a half inches. I'll run all three through the table saw exactly the same, but I'll save you some time and not repeat all the videos. Using the good edge against the joiner fence, I'll joint one side flat and then check for squareness. I'll then joint the other edge square to the good face. I'm at my finished width now. I'll do this with all three pieces and then run the final rough side through the planer to ensure an even thickness. Now, I'll cut some more laminate so that I can cover the two rails. I'll spare you some cutting here as well. Here's the output with a laminate cut for two rails, and here's the two beach rails, plus a spare that I think will be helpful in assembly. I should also note that we still have the slider base piece as well, which is six inches wide. We need two pieces for the slider assembly, and I left them somewhere. Oh yeah, here they are. I still need to cut the sliders to their final width. I'll temporarily put the T-slot and Craig stop onto the fence and measure the width that's left. I'll transfer that measurement over to the table saw, and then I'll set the measurement and run the two blocks through. Now we'll cut some laminate for the two slides, and I'll save you a cut or two here as well. When I glue the laminate on the fences, I don't want any glue overspray on these edges. So I'm going to cover the edges with painter's tape and trim the excess off flush. Here's how easy this is to do in a small piece as an example. A razor blade knife can trim the tape flush to the edge. You've got the idea here, so I'll move on. There's more 3M Super 77 going down. I'll let that tack up for a couple of minutes and then get the laminate down and do some J-rolling. I've got some nice heavy beach that I'll use as a weight on the laminated rails. Here are the slider parts getting laminated and I'll put a little weight on them as well until they're dry. Say, if you're new to this channel, consider subscribing, hitting the bell and leaving a comment. As a bonus, I'll share a very unique method of storing a table saw sled in the next video and you don't want to miss out on that. So there's a nice payoff for your subscription. Okay, skipping ahead a few hours, the pieces are now dry. Let's get the tape off the fences and slides. You might have to take it off in pieces, particularly if some of it has glue overspray on the top surface. You can see that the wood underneath is nice and clean, exactly what we wanted. Let's move to trimming the edges of the laminate to be flush with the wood. I'm using the same bit as before and the same general technique. Because some of these pieces are pretty small, I'm using a push block for safety. You've seen this rudder in action already, so let's move on. Let's focus on the sliding rails for a bit. The rails need a groove cut through them. To make the groove, I put together a very simple jig. This jig is just made out of some scrap pine and a bit of plywood in the base. You can see the rail in white, and I marked a line where I'd like the groove to be. The jig uses a compression fit via a couple of wedges. I'll show you how it works. To loosen the jig, I just tap out a wedge. Now everything falls apart. I'm using a piece of paper to make the area where my router base sits level or just slightly proud of the slide rail. To put everything back together, just reverse the process. With the router in place, I can move it between the two stop blocks and use the router fence against the jig to keep the line nice and straight. You can choose to route the slot in the standard router direction, or you can reverse the direction and step cut the laminate, which can reduce the chance of chip out. It's your choice. Take a few plunge passes to get all the way through the slide rail. Follow the same process with the second rail, and in the end, you'll have two slide rails that look like this. We can try one of the T-handles in the slots to test the fit. The fit is good, so I'll give it a big thumbs up. Let's loosely assemble the sled on the table saw and figure out where our T-handle knob should be located on the rail. To do this, I'm going to open the sliding base to one inch, which is about the width of the widest dado blade I would run on this saw. I'm going to put some one inch pieces of wood in the blade gap. 
to stabilize and align the sliding base against the main sled base. I cut a few shorter pieces of scrap maple to accommodate the splitter which sticks up on the zero clearance throw plate. Now we can loosely assemble the pieces again and put our slide rails on the front and back. I'll mark the slot position on each rail. I'll give you an idea of where the T-handle knob should be placed. It should be at the right end of the hole and then the sliding base can move from the one inch opening to a smaller width to accommodate any blades that you want to use. While we're here, let's check our top rail clearance. Looks like my clearance is fine. I do need to cut some rail to add it to the end of the fence. You can cut the aluminum rail with a carbide blade at the miter saw. But first, remember to clean up any sawdust you have around the miter saw and take the bag off the saw. A spark could start a fire. Take your time going through the aluminum. Let's check the fit on the sled fence. Looks pretty good to me. Taking a look at the back sled fence, I could lighten this up a little bit. I need the part on the sliding base, but I could shorten up the part on the main sled to save a bit of weight. I'm going to cut about six inches off the fence. I think I'll put a little bevel on the corners as well. Here's another look at the back fence now. Let's trace out the slot. I've marked the hole location in the fence where I want to place the T-handle. I'll make a hole and use a threaded insert for the handle. I took a spare Allen key and cut off the 90 degree angle on it so that I can use it in the drill press and get the inserts in the hole at a perfect 90 degrees. I just used a grinder to cut the Allen key and then I cleaned it up a little with a file. Let's drill our hole with a brad point bit. I'm using some painter's tape as a depth gauge. Now I'm going to chamfer the top of the hole so that I don't get any laminate chip out when I put the threaded insert into the hole. This also ensures that I can put the threaded insert slightly below the surface of the laminate so that it's not creating friction with the slide rail. I just turn the drill chuck by hand to install the threaded insert. We then follow the exact same procedure for the other rail. I'll skip showing the other rail to save some time. Now, we have all the parts made, but we haven't attached anything yet. Here's my dry assembly, and I'll start by connecting the fence on the outfeed side of the saw first. This is the least important fence in terms of accuracy and squareness. Here's a close-up of the outfeed fence sliding assembly. Note that the knobs I'm using can protrude below the base of the sled. I'm using 2 inch knobs, and you could use a smaller knob to avoid this if you prefer. I'm going to be sure to position this fence where I have sufficient room for the knob to be able to rotate freely. I'll use my square to preset the distance and draw a line on the extendable base wing where I want the fence to align. I'll take the extendable base wing over to the assembly table and draw the same mark on the bottom side. I'll put the sliding rail on the line and draw my second line. Now we can see the placement of the rail and the width. I'm also going to mark where the slot is so that I don't put a screw through the slot. We'll put some holes into the bottom side of the extendable wing in the center of the marked width of the rail with a countersunk drill bit. I'll make four holes, which is probably two more than I really need, but hey, that's just the way that I work. Remember to make the countersinks a little bit deep to ensure the screw head is below the laminate. We definitely don't want them to drag on the saw table when we use the sled. Now, I'll clamp the slide rail to the adjustable base and pre-drill the holes in the rail and then put in some screws. I'll snug them up by hand to make sure that everything is well seated. I'm back at the table saw now and I'm determining where the slide rail needs to be aligned to the outfeed fence. I need about an inch of overhang on the outfeed fence to give me the maximum opening width of one inch for the widest dado blades that I typically run with this saw. I'll use my square setting to align the outfeed fence to the table. I have a magnetic level keeping the base alignment on the infeed side. I'll draw a line on the base of the sled to mark where the outfeed rail will attach to the base. Let's get the base onto the assembly table. The line that I drew is not showing up on camera as well as I'd like, but it is there. Let's flip the base over and get our line on the bottom side using the same square setting. Then I'll use the rail to get the width and add a second line. Back to the drill press to countersink about seven holes. I'll spare you some of the drilling. Okay, the seven holes are drilled and I have the sled sitting on the table saw with the blade opening nice and wide. I have the outfeed rail and the slide rail lined up nice and flush and I've put a couple of spacers in the blade opening to keep everything nice and square. A magnetic level at the front of the sled is keeping the front generally aligned as well. 
The slide base is clamped to the table saw, so everything is reasonably solid. Let's pre-drill the fence for the screws and put the screws in place. I'll save you some time and show you the first one, and spare you the next six. Okay, now for the infeed fence, and this is where alignment is critical. I'm going to start with a screw in the extendable wing. Remember again to place the fence where the knobs have good clearance and use your square to check the measurement. We'll follow the exact same process to pre-drill and countersink a hole in the bottom of the extendable wing. We then align the extendable rail and pre-drill and sink in a screw. I have reassembled the sled with the lock knobs in place on both sides. I can pivot the infeed fence to get a square setting. My initial alignment is done with a Japanese square that I know is reasonably close to a true 90 degrees. I'll mark the position of the infeed fence and I'll put a screw through the base into the fence near the end for my initial setting. To see how square this fence is, I'll use the five cut method. I'll take a piece of particle board and number the sides. We'll start with side one and make the cut. Then side one will rotate to the fence and we'll cut side two and go around the particle board. While I'm not at a perfect 90 degrees right now, I will say that I'm enjoying the size of this sled and how well it glides on the tabletop. It feels really nice. When all four sides are cut, we'll put side four against the fence and take a fifth cut that's a little bit wider. We'll take this wider strip and mark the top and bottom with a T and a B. Then let's take our calipers and measure the top. It looks like it's at 1.093. The bottom is at 1.048. The difference between the numbers is 0.045 or 45 one thousandths of an inch. I divide that number by 4 for the four sides of the board that I squared up. That gives us 0.01125. I then divide that by the length of the strip that I cut, which is 17 inches. That gives us 0 0.00066176. I then multiply that number by the distance between the two screws that I put into the bottom of the fence. In my case, the two screws are 23 and 3 quarter inches apart. That leaves me with 0 0.015 or about 15 one thousandths of an inch. That means my fence is off by 15 one thousandths of an inch over the length of 23 and 3 quarter inches. For woodworking, that variance is generally acceptable, but we know we can do better. One thing I want to note before we proceed is that my initial results may be better than yours. My tools are well calibrated and I check them often. I also used a square that I know from experience and mathematics is very square and so on. If you get a result that is worse, for example, 150 thousandths of an inch, don't worry about it. You can follow the exact same steps to get your fence dialed into your saw and achieve really great squareness in your shop. Just follow the steps. We'll start off by marking the exact position of the fence where it is right now. I'm using a board with a point on it. I'll put the point approximately where the screw is in the base that is holding this end of the fence. Put the point right against the fence and clamp down the board. Now we can take the screw out of the base. For the next step, we'll use the thickness gauge set to 15 one thousandths, which is the amount of my variance. Put the gauge right on the reference point and then snug the fence up to it. We're moving the end of the fence down slightly by 15 one thousandths to compensate for the amount it is out. Note that we had a positive number when we did our math, so we must move the fence down to get to a neutral setting. If you were off by a negative number, then you'd move the fence up. We'll clamp this up securely and get a screw back into a new hole. Now let's do the five cut method again and see if we're closer to true square. I'll zoom through a bit of this because you've seen it before. Remember again to mark the top and bottom of the final cut piece. The top is at 1.050. The bottom is 1.046. Let's do our math. Subtract the bottom from the top and we have 0 0.004. Then divide this by 4 for the four sides cut and we have 0 0.001. Then divide this amount 
by the length of the cut piece, which is 16.5 inches, and that gives us 0 0.00006061. Now multiply that by the length between the two screws in the base, which is 26 inches, and we have a resulting 0 0.001. So we are 1 one thousandths of an inch out over 26 inches. I'm very happy with this result, and this is more than close enough for woodworking. Right now, our infeed fence is only fastened in two spots, basically at each end. We know it's really nice and accurate, and we don't want to mess up its positioning. We could take several clamps and put them all the way down the fence, but the act of clamping can move the fence a small amount. Regardless of the clamp type used, there's always the possibility of movement. The act of putting in screws and the resulting torque force can also move a fence a small amount. So we're going against popular opinion on how to attach this fence and coming up with our own technique that will de-risk the installation for us. I'm going to use a strip of plywood that's laminated on one side. We'll install this piece of plywood behind the fence and attach it with CA glue. We'll glue the bottom to the base and the side to the fence. Our fingers are sensitive enough to ensure that the fence does not move while we install the strip of plywood. And we can hold it in place until the CA glue and activator dries. Once it's completely dried and solid, I'll put a few screws into the strip to ensure it doesn't move in the future. Using this method ensured that my fence did not move in the final steps of installation. I'm still at 1 one thousandths of an inch over 26 inches when finished. I'd encourage you to give this method a try when you build a table saw sled. Next step, we'll attach our blue guide rail on the fence. There is a line in the guide rail that we can use to position our screws. We'll drill some holes into the guide rail. I have two sections due to the length of the sled. Let's drill some holes. I'm using a 5 30 seconds inch bit which is a little larger than the screws I plan to use. We attached the rail using some number 8 panhead screws that were 1 half inch in length. In here you can see the rail in position. As a woodworker I don't use panhead screws very often but I thought they looked nice in this case. We'll make sure the slide rails are still good with the guide rail attached. Everything slides really nice. Let's try it out. We'll start with the standard thin curved blade in the saw. That works great as planned. Now let's try a wider dado blade. The end result is a really square and wide dado with a very clean cut. This adjustable sled is going to make a great addition to the shop. If you enjoyed this video, please do consider subscribing. In fact, if you're considering making a table saw sled, I'll have a bonus for you in the next video. When you have a table saw sled, you'll find that it's often sitting on a bench or the saw when it's not in use and you're constantly moving it around to free up space. It's also a bit difficult to store because it's not flat. The guide rail is on the bottom. In the next video, I'll show you a great way to build a storage solution for the table saw sled so that it's safe and out of your way when not in use. If you subscribe and hit the notification bell, you'll get access to the video. I'd also really appreciate hearing your comments, and I will reply. So if you have questions or advice, feel free to leave a comment. There are a couple of people I'd like to thank who influenced some information in the video. I'm not sure who invented the five cut method, but William Ng was the first to show me the five cut method in the math to check squareness. William has a great video on this, and I'll try to find the link and attach it in the comments. Second, I'd like to thank the team at Woodsmith where I first saw the adjustable base concept for a table saw sled. The concept stuck in my head and I added a sliding base to my sled and it definitely adds a lot of versatility. I'll provide a link to their video as well. Thanks very much for watching this video. Stay safe and have fun in the shop.